Thank you for joining us for this edition of Book Spectrum, the I just got my voice back version. I'm Chris Cordani, your host. The definition of radicals seem to have changed over the years. Today's radicals are on camera talking about re-educating people and throwing non-believers in gulags, while yesterday's radicals simply wanted the right to vote or own property. Really, that was radical back then? As we observe the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage in the U.S., as per the ratification of the 19th Amendment, I'm talking with the author of the book Roses and Radicals, the epic story of how American women won the right to vote, who did extensive research on the entire movement and its aftermath. Susan Zimmett, welcome to the show. Thank you, Chris. It's really a pleasure to be on your show. Thank you for inviting me. What inspired you to write this book, Susan? Well, basically, you know, I have for um, pretty much my entire life been very pro-women and very pro-women issues and children's issues. I'm passionate about issues. So this is something I've cared about a lot. And through my work life, you know, I've always pushed the envelope in terms of being a woman in the business world and making sure that, you know, I got promoted when I needed to be promoted and received the salaries that I needed to receive. You know, so I was always outspoken and challenging. But one day um, I was up in Kingston, I was a county legislator at the time, and I picked up a newspaper, and in the back of the paper, it was the New York Times, and in the back of the paper was a um, column about the Forgotten Movement, and it was all about the 100th anniversary of the women's right to vote that was coming up in eight years, and then it talked about the movement, and I remember thinking, how could I not know about this? How do I not know about the history of women receiving the right to vote? And I decided that I really had wanted to, you know, get on top of this and be a part of the celebration. So I ended up going to Seneca Falls in Rochester, which is really basically the birthplace of the movement. I went and visited with Congresswoman Congresswoman Louise Slaughter, who unfortunately just passed away a year ago, um, an amazing woman, and went to talk to her up in Rochester about the 100th anniversary. And they said, Susan, the Congresswoman will be all over this but you need to go to the Susan B. Anthony house, which is in Rochester, and get them on board. So I went over to the Susan B. Anthony house. I sat down with the director of the Susan B. Anthony house, Deborah Hughes, and she said, Susan, you fell from heaven. She said, we're all these small houses. We all want to get working on the 100th anniversary, but we can't really take this whole thing on. Basically, tag your it. Now, that was pretty funny because I didn't know much about the movement, but all of a sudden I was being anointed as a person to sort of work on this. When she took me for a private tour of the Susan B. Anthony house, we were standing outside on the street, and I was told that the house was exactly like it was when Susan B. Anthony lived there in the 1800s. The street was exactly like it was when she lived there in the 1800s. And it hit me, and I'm not necessarily a history lover, but it hit me that because of this woman— I could actually be the person I was, an elected official, a vice president of an advertising agency, that it was because of these people before me. When we went through the house and got the tour, when we got upstairs into her bedroom, which is where she actually died, there was a plexiglass um, box with a alligator purse in there and a little rhyme. And I could not believe there was a rhyme when I was a little girl and so many women jump rope to this. Miss Lucy has a steamboat. The steamboat has a bell. <laughs> Miss Lucy had, uh, went to heaven. The steamboat went to hello operator. It goes on. Then it says, in came the um, doctor, in came the nurse, in came the woman with the alligator purse. And I was like, oh, my God, Susan B. Anthony was a woman with the alligator purse. I can't believe this. So I was basically smitten. and that was it. I was going to be working on this. Ironically, um, I got distracted by fracking and started working on fracking, and we were very successful you know, with the fracking moratorium, and then I got back on this. So I created a not-for-profit called 2020 Project Woman to basically take on the 100th anniversary of the women's right to vote. Who the people I brought onto the board, one of the people was Amy Burkauer from Writer's House, who's one of the most successful literary agents in the country, if not the world, who happens to be one of my oldest friends from childhood. So she was on the board, and it was basically through Amy and us working together on this project that Amy basically ultimately said, Susan, you need to write a book about this. And that's how this whole entire thing evolved. We wrote, you know, we wrote up the presentation. She sent it to Viking Publishing. Viking Publishing made me an author, and the rest is history. 
Susan Zimmett is with me on Book Spectrum. She is the author of Roses and Radicals, the epic story of how American women won the right to vote. Susan, this is a book that's meant for all ages. It's easy for the young girl to read, and the information can be soaked in by the the smartest of readers as well and the oldest of readers. Yes. Um, the book is um, Viking Publishing. It's basically for middle school and high school. That was who the book was is meant for. So it's a young adult book. However, um, it's interesting. When I was writing the book, um, when we were working on the book, I remember thinking, oh, my God, this seems too old, seems too old. And then I had to remember when I was in seventh grade, we read The Odyssey in school. And I loved that book. And I started to think, I read The Odyssey in seventh grade. If you read The Odyssey, it's not an easy book. So, you know, I think I was forgetting how possibly more sophisticated younger kids are. But ultimately, the book was written for young adults. Um, but with all the reviews that we've gotten, extraordinary reviews from the New York Times to Kirkus to Publishers Weekly to start reviews and book lists, um, you know, um, the um, – Chicago Tribune wrote an incredible full-page review, and they said, even though this book is meant for young adults, it sure schooled me. And basically what everybody's saying about this book is that it is great for young readers to understand from the beginning to the end what this fight was all about in a very um, historical but comprehensive and entertaining way to read it, but even adults you know, can read this book and learn a lot. And so what's great about it, it's not a big, gigantic, heavy sort of textbook. You know, um, it's a very, an adult could sit down and read it basically in three hours, and they will be so educated to the movement. Um, it's quite remarkable. So, yeah, it's been wonderful because the book has been being embraced by all of the experts in the young adult book market, as well as, you know, the adult market. Susan, as you know, 2020 is the 100th anniversary Women Won the Right to Vote. But this was a fight that predated the Civil War. That's what a lot of people don't really know. I know that we're taught uh, in elementary school, maybe, or high school, you're taught there was a Seneca Falls Convention of 1848, but women were active in politics and trying to get the right to vote even before that. So basically, in, in essence... What happened, which is very, very fascinating, and if you read Roses and Radicals, you know, we start, we have these sidebars. Um, so the book starts with Elizabeth Cady Stanton going over to the anti abolition um, um, conference in London. Um, but we have these sidebars about Know Your Radicals. And so it goes back even way before that, where it starts with Anne Hutchinson and what happened with her. And then it goes into other radicals from way before when the story really even begins. So there were a lot of women fighting for rights. Now, what people don't understand and what young adults don't understand is that basically, and I'm not saying this negatively by any means whatsoever, I'm saying I didn't understand it either. I just think young adults need to understand how fragile their rights are, especially during a time when a lot of our rights are being challenged. But basically, before women got the right to vote in the early 1800s, in the late 1700s, a woman, when she got married, became her husband's property. She had no individual identity. She became her husband's property. If they had children and he wanted to take the children away from her and give it to the woman next door, he could do that. She had no right to her own child. If he wanted to beat her up, she had there was nothing called domestic violence. She was property of her husband, and he could beat her up, and she had no recourse. If she worked, all the money went to her husband, and he could just go to the local bar and drink it away. If, um, you know, when her father died and left her property, it became the husband's property. So women and women couldn't even I mean, you can't even imagine this today. Women could not speak in public. They couldn't speak in public. So a lot of these women were fighting um, for anti, you know, um, in the abolitionist movement. They were trying to end slavery. And what ended up happening is a lot of these women were involved, but a lot of them weren't even able to speak at these meetings. So a number of women went over to um, London for this um, for a um, massive anti-slavery convention, and these women who were delegates back in America weren't even allowed the right to be on the floor or speak or vote, and they were put upstairs behind a curtain. And it was at that meeting where Elizabeth Cady Stanton met Lucretia, um, Lucretia Ma. The two of them be spat in speaking, and that's when they realized, here we are fighting, you know, for the rights of black men. What about our own rights? 
and they came back to America, and that's when they started to sort of work on not only you know um, um, ending slavery, but on women's voting rights. At a certain point, there did come a split a little bit in between, you know, who felt we needed to get slavery abolished first and, you know, who felt we're not going to abandon the right to vote, but very much intertwined, and it's been going on for a very long time. So the 100 years celebration of our right to vote is really just 100 years of when this sort of battle began, but, oh, my God, women have been fighting for their rights for a very long time against great odds. And Susan, there were women who also worked to educate other women and led other reform movements of the 19th century. Well, you have a lot of women. And again, in Roses and Radicals, we have the sidebars of, you know, know your radicals. And um, so there were just, I mean, Sojourner Truth was an amazing woman who couldn't even read or write, who traveled the country, you know, dealing with, um, you know, talking about slavery, but also, you know, talking about um, women's rights. Amazing woman. You had the Grimke sisters. It was um, Sarah Grimke and her sister Angelina Grimke. They were amazing. Um, these were two women who actually grew up in a house with slaves, and they just could not stand, you know, um, the thought of having slaves that really affected them. And they became really forward thinkers, and they started speaking all over the place, and they became very, very, very renowned speakers um, on the issue of women's rights. They were absolutely unbelievable. Um, you know, there's um, Victoria Woodhull. She is a character in of herself. I'm telling you, she has such an amazing story. She was very much of a free thinker. Um, She believed in free love. She believed in, um, you know, a woman's right to choose. She was the first woman to run for president, but ended up in jail. She couldn't even vote for herself. Amazing story. You got Lucy Stone. Um, Oh, my God, I could keep going on and on. There's just so many women. Alice Paul, um, 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 you know, who was just absolutely amazing. You know, you have the older women like um, Carrie Catt and Alice Paul and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who led the beginning of the movement. And then the end of the movement was much younger women, um, um, Alice Paul and um, Alice Paul, who based and Lucy Burns, who really took the movement I got it over the, you know, over the line, and they were really radical. And you know, and um, Alice Paul was starved in jail. These women were thrown in jail. Understand? Right. These women, they started. What people don't understand is civil disobedience actually started with um, the women's suffrage, and they were the first people to actually protest in front of the White House. And they protested in front of the White House, and then when World War One happened. People thought they would stop protesting, but these women said they wouldn't do it. They were called the silent senators. They would stand in front of the White House with picket signs, but they wouldn't say anything. Eventually, because they were influencing what you know um, they believed was impacting the war, they got thrown in jail. They were, these, now these were you know very you know middle class, upper class women. Some of them even sat at the president's table at the White House. Some of their husbands were congressmen and senators thrown into horrific, horrific conditions in jails, starved, force-fed, beaten, you know, all because they were asking for the right to vote. So it's a very dramatic story that people really don't know about, including myself, as I said. But, you know, when people learn about what these women went through to get us the right to vote, I think people will take their vote much more seriously and not basically say, oh, it's not worth it, it doesn't matter, because this is a right that not only was fought for, you know, with these women putting their lives on the line, but people all over the world fight for the right to vote, and we in America take it for granted and think it doesn't even matter and don't understand how important it truly is. Now, you mentioned that uh, World War I era. Little did these women and, of course, their opponents know that it would be a woman running day-to-day operations of the country in the uh, last couple of years (laughs) of Wilson's presidency. Right, right, right. Absolutely. Well, actually, um, no kidding, um, Wilson got very, very sick um, towards the end, and they were actually hiding it. And his wife, Edith Wilson, was really pretty much running the country. Yeah, they told the VP um, to go away. (laughs) 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 He's like, we don't need you here. You're out. Well, look, well, you know, well, you know, look, a lot of things people don't know. There were a lot of inventions, like the washing machine or the dryer, um, you know, that were, you know, the patent, you know, the, like a, a, um, a African American woman way back when came up with, you know, the um, an idea of how to do a washing machine, but because she was a black woman, she didn't believe that she'd be able to get the patent and get taken seriously, and all she cared about was making women's lives easier from the drudgery of 
home care, you know, and um, she gave it to a man, and the man got the credit for doing it. There are so many women. Well, look about look at the movie, the most recent movie, Hidden Figures. Right. You know about these women who were so instrumental in the space, you know, movement, but they never got the credit. So, truth be told, there's probably a lot of men running around and in our history books that take credit for ideas and inventions that were really created by women. I'm sure there were a lot of men who uh, who who gained a little more con- power, confidence, and some ideas from women dating back to uh, even the Dark Ages and before. I, this happens. Women may not have had political power out in the open, but a lot or a few of them kind of knew what they were doing on the inside. The, the clear well, well, patches of the world were rare. Yes. <laughs> oh, right, right, right. But no, no, but, but if you think, you know, it's actually funny because people would probably feel that the eastern states were the first states to give women the right to vote, you know, but that's not the truth at all. It was actually the western states that gave women the right to vote, and a lot of western states, when they got constituted, put the women's right to vote right into their constitution. And that was because when they were traveling west, first and foremost, the woman that went with them were so instrumental in traveling and setting up the state that the men felt they deserved the right to vote because they helped settle the state. But then also they actually advertised, um, you know, you know, they felt by giving women the right to vote, they could then promote that and that would get more women to move out west. Um, you know, so women have been basically influencing this world since the beginning of time. They've just never had the public voice nor the public credit. And even today, well, even today, you know, I have to say it's 2020, and even today, women still don't have equal pay. Women still get, you know, passed over in, um, you know, promotions. We still don't have a woman president. Women still face incredible misogyny, you know, in, you know, the workplace and in the political world, and our rights are being eroded every day in front of us. And so women still have not really gotten their rightful place in history or in the world. Susan Zimmett, the author of Roses and Radicals, is with me on Book Spectrum. We talk about the right to vote because this is a focal point of, of the book, obviously. The focal point, if you will, and of course being the 100th anniversary this year of uh, women's suffrage. Do you believe a lot of these rights, especially the right to vote by everybody, not just women, have been taken for granted or are being taken for granted these days? Absolutely, totally, comprehensively, absolutely. You know, the percentage of people who vote is so minuscule. So what people are doing is they're allowing a small segment of the population to make a decision for for the rest of the country, and that's not really democracy at its best. Um, but also what's happened is over the years, and people have fought so hard, you know, for the rights to vote, and even after the um, 19th Amendment was passed, there's still in the South were a lot of obstacles put in place so um, black people could not vote. Um, and so it wasn't even until like the 1960s that, you know, more rights were given in terms of voting. However, you've got two things going on right now. You have people so dissatisfied with government feeling, you know, that the Republicans and Democrats are so marginalized and polarized, you know, that at the end of the day, people feel they only care about themselves, about their positions, about keeping their positions, and that they don't feel like they're really caring about us, the average person. So a lot of people are turned off. You have a lot of people who are just, you know, trying to make ends meet. You know, they're working one or two jobs to just try to put food on the table. They're basically trying to, you know, you know, take care of their kids. They're running to soccer if they're fortunate enough to be able to afford to play soccer, you know, or ballet or horseback riding or, you know, in band or whatever kind of stuff. So, you know, then all of also having to take care of their kids' homework, you know, with all of these now standards and whatever. So people are tired. People are working really hard. And people don't feel that the government is really addressing their needs. So people say, what does it matter? There's no difference between a Democrat or Republican. My vote doesn't matter anyway. And so people are not using their vote. And so that's very, very scary. But then simultaneously what's happening now is you've got state state leaders trying to put barricades, you know, in the place of people voting or trying to dis enfranchise people, you know, from voting or kicking them off the voters' rolls. So you also have our government officials who are trying to take the right to vote away. And then let's add on top of it the voting machines, which in of itself, I quite frankly find very scary. And I was 
as a Ulster County legislator, I took this issue on. I went up to Albany. I testified about how we could get our lever machines to be um, the Help America Voting Act so they would be HAVA compliant. But these new machines, you have two machines, DREs and optical scan. In New York State, optical scan, you fill out a little ballot, you put it in. There's a paper ballot that can be counted after the vote if anybody thinks there's a discrepancy. But in a lot of the swing states, you have what's called DREs. Those are electronic machines that have no paper ballot. So you vote on those machines. The votes are in there. You cannot go back and recount them on a paper ballot, and those machines can be manipulated. And it's been proven over and over again those machines can be manipulated. So can you even at this point trust the machine that you're voting on? So I find it a very, very scary time, quite frankly. But one thing I will do is I still will always vote. Susan, let's get back to the book, Roses and Radicals. You did discuss the history of the women's right to vote movement. How important is suffrage? Were the presidential runs by Victoria Woodhull in 1872 and Belva Lockwood in both uh, 1884 and 88? Well, I would hate to say probably not that important from the perspective of a historical perspective, because probably most <clears throat> people don't even know who they are. You know? So obviously the impact, you know, <clears throat> had, didn't resonate in a lot of ways. However, for people like myself, um, you know, to learn about these two women who ran for president before we even had the right to vote, to know that these women created their own equal rights parties was very, very important <clears throat> to me. Um, and, um, you know, and again, you know, like the bravery that these women showed was really, really phenomenal. But unfortunately, they don't have their right place in history. Susan, the first woman to break 40,000 presidential votes in a presidential election was Gracie Allen. But you didn't know that. Was she married to... Um, was she married to... Um, that's the Gracie Allen, yes. Yes. Yeah, oh, seriously, I, you're right. I did not know that. 1940, the surprise even, party. <laughs> <laughs> seriously? Very seriously. Well, well, thank you for sharing that. I didn't know that. That's a great fact. But it was 40,000 <laughs> votes. It might have been a little bit of fun. But from then uh -huh. on, we've had a lot of women who've actually run for president in minor parties. Unfortunately, a lot of them were the Communist or Socialist Workers Party. But you did in 1972 get a faithless voter that put uh, or that gave the first electoral vote to a woman, Tony Nathan. Uh -huh. And it kind of started snowballing up from there. Well, I mean, you've had women... Um, put themselves out there throughout history to accomplish something great. Um, but again, why are all of these women not known, not everyday names that people have heard? You know, again, that's the point of this book, Roses and Radicals, the epic story of how American women won the right to vote, is to give these women a voice to give these radicals a voice to have people understand how long and how hard these women were fighting for just everyday rights, not just for the right to vote. It wasn't really just for Susan B. Anthony. She was very, very focused for Carrie, Cat, Carrie Chapman Cat, very focused on the right to vote. Alice Burns, very focused on the right to vote. But you had people like Matilda Jocelyn Gage, who was sort of written out of history in a lot of ways. Again, another really incredible radical that people don't really know about. But she was not just about the right to vote. She was about equal pay. She was about separation of church and state because she felt it was a church that really, you know, like kept women down. She was all for like abolishing alcohol because, you know, of the impact it had when men would come home and beat their wives. You know, she was about so many other issues, as many other women radicals were, you know, it wasn't just the right to vote. You know, the right to vote enfranchised women to at least have a choice and a voice in who was going to represent them. But there were so many other issues like, you know, being able to own your own property, being able to keep your child, being able to not, you know, like be beaten by your husband and have no recourse. So there have been battles that these women have been fighting for a long time, and we are still today fighting which again goes back to why that again which goes back to why this book is so important for young people to read so they understand you know the history of the battles for these rights susan you brought up something very important domestic violence that was another huge issue women faced uh, yes. and, and we're talking about centuries they had no political power how much had advocacy for victims played a role in support for women's suffrage 
Um, you know, that's a question I don't feel really capable of answering. However, I suspect that probably, you know, um, a lot of women who were being abused probably might have joined, you know, the battle. Um, but, you know, again, this is not something I've really studied, um, although it would be interesting to look into. But what I will say in today's world, okay, you know, again, look at the amount of abuse of women. Look at, like, you know, women in, um, you know, African countries and Muslim countries, you know, that have, you know, well, you know, in some of the African countries where the women are being, you know, literally, you know, if a woman gets raped, if a girl gets raped, she's kicked out of her family. It's like, like the girl is blamed, like it was her fault. Yeah, some go to she's jail for that. Family yes. because she's brought, yeah, you know, because she brought disgrace on her family, okay? And other, you know, in, in some countries, a husband can still basically kill his wife through having an affair or something. You know, you know, you have people who get, you know, get stoned, who get burnt alive. You know, you have, you know, you still have, um, um, you know, women in a lot of these countries, who just, you know, they can't drive cars, you know, what Saudi Arabian women, I think, just recently got the right to be able to drive a car. So, you know, people all over the country, oh my, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, all over the world, you know, young girls and women still do not have the right of, you know, basically being an equal citizen in, you know, an equal citizen to be treated respectfully. More nations should follow our example. But again, we took a long time, too. Well, I mean, I we're think, a young country, but it still took us a long either. time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I don't, I don't still think, no, no, no. But I would not hold up our country, unfortunately. I wouldn't hold our country up as a standard bearer either from the perspective that, you know, you know, if you still look at, um, you know, how rape victims are treated, sure, there's been laws that have been put in place to try to protect them. But I still don't think, you know, the laws are really really completely favorable to somebody who experiences rape. You know, I still think, you know, if you look at domestic violence, it was very interesting. I have been the town supervisor of Newport, and I ended up learning myself about, you know, when, uh, when, um, when um, a woman calls the police to come, you know, on a domestic violence thing, that it basically, you know, when the guy gets there, the woman gets scared. She might not, like, admit she might take it back because she's terrified, Right. And so then the woman calls again, then the woman calls again, and the police start to sort of feel like, oh, my God, you know, this woman's crazy. No, statistics show it takes eight times for a woman, when she calls a police officer, eight times until she finally has the courage to basically tell the police what's going on and stand up for herself. So the police have to be trained, and I was taught this when I was a supervisor, police have to be trained to, like, look around the house and look for cues. So, like, for example, if you see a dog cowering, you know, cowering in the corner, chances are that dog is being abused, and that's a telltale sign. If you see, like, frayed, like, you know, um, you know, like frayed wires or something, you know, that's a telltale sign that the woman might be getting hit with the wires. There are certain things that police are supposed to look at because they've been trained, hopefully, to understand that because a woman calls you doesn't mean a woman is going to be able to actually go on record about her abuse because she's terrified. So you have to understand the psychology of a woman being abused in order to be able to, you know, take care of, you know, her needs kind of stuff. So, again, you know, we still have too much, you know, domestic abuse. We have too many women living in poverty. We have too many children, you know, that are going to school hungry. We have too many people living on the streets. And a lot of it is basically, you know, like, you know, is women. You know, more women live in poverty. More women, you know, are basically hungry. More women are sexually abused. You know, it's just, it goes on and on and on. The book is Roses and Radicals. Susan Zimmett, the author, is here with me on Book Spectrum. In your non-author life, Susan... You devoted much of your yes. time to fighting against hunger in New York. Yes. So um, um, it's something that I've always really believed passionately in. So even as like a youngster, you know, um, you know, I would be involved in doing, um, you know, food drives and different things like that. But um, when I was a supervisor of the town of Newport, I made sure that, you know, our beloved family of Newport, family of Woodstock, which was, you know, the, um, the emergency food provider, 
for you know the people in New Plus who needed um, food and another other services. I actually increased their budget, you know, to make sure they had the kind of money that they needed to provide the services that they needed. Um, you know, then I became like an executive director for an anti-hunger advocacy organization. So I was lobbying up in Albany on a lot of different issues, and not just more money for the emergency food pantries but the issue of lifting people out of poverty, because basically what I learned in the hunger field is first people pay their housing costs, which we all know, you know can be extraordinarily expensive. Then they pay for the heat. Um, and then if they have health insurance, they're fortunate enough to have health insurance, they pay for that. Food is the last thing to go, you know, so they can always go to a pantry to get food. Now, God forbid they have a little bit of extra money, but then their car breaks down. They've got to pay for their car so they can get to work. So what happened was that basically the emergency feeding programs that were created a long time ago to be an emergency program um, is now basically a lifeline for too many people living in our country. And it's now... Like, it, it's now almost like the supermarket for the poor. Um, and so we have so many food banks, so many emergency feeding programs, so many people in need. So we've got to deal with the poverty issues like living wages, affordable housing, affordable health care, um, you know, in order to help lift people out of poverty so they won't face hunger. But the thing that I also think we need to really understand is that it, we have to we have to deal with it at the front end, not at the back end. And what I mean about that is if a kid goes to school hungry, how do you expect a kid to pay attention and not act out? So a kid ends up acting out, they get sent to the principal, they keep getting in trouble, eventually they drop out of school, they get into trouble, they end up in jail. So we end up paying for this child who maybe we fed at the beginning so they could learn, you know, we end up paying for them by being in jail. Because people don't have money to buy healthy food, they buy cheap food that basically fills them up, but doesn't really basically take care of their nutritional needs. And now we have, you know, an incredible obesity problem, diabetes. And so now, again, we're paying for it on the back end with Medicaid. So, you know, we've got to get our priorities straight in the sense of we've got to address the needs at the front end so we can lessen the needs at the back end. Susan Zimmett, what would you like your readers to learn most from Roses and Radicals? Um, well, I would like for them to learn this amazing history, um, what it was all about, what these women went through, and how they really basically went against all odds, put themselves and their personal safety on the line to basically win women the right to vote. So ultimately, when I go speak to young people, when I do some book tours, what I pretty much, the bottom line is pretty much to get young people to understand not just the importance of voting, but don't let anybody ever tell you that you can't achieve your life dreams because look at what these women did against all odds. They got us the right to vote. Many of them never even lived to see this come to, you know, come to fruition. They didn't even get to vote. But they put their life on the line for this battle, and they ultimately won. And so I just would like young, young adults to understand, if you've got a dream, you go for it. And don't let anybody tell you that you can't achieve it, because look at these brave women and look what they achieved. And that, to me, is like pretty much the most important thing that underlies this book. And this is something that's really glossed over in history classes. The kids... Oh, my really God, glossed taught. over, yeah. glossed over. We, we, you know, I, you know, we were never taught this. Now, I'll tell you a really interesting story, at least for me. I loved Mary Poppins, the movie Mary Poppins. I loved it. I used to watch it as a kid, Thanksgiving. My mother would scream at me to come back to the table. Loved Mary Poppins. The reason I loved Mary Poppins was because the story was about a father who was so into his job that he didn't pay attention to his children. And at the very end of the movie, you know, he realizes, you know, that his children are more important than anything. And he runs off and goes and flies a kite with the kids. And that's what I loved about it, you know, and stuff. I didn't realize till I started working on this project that Mrs. Burns, the mother of, you know, the children that Mary Poppins came to be the nanny for, was a suffrage. Okay, so throughout the whole month movie, she comes back. Now, the, um, um, the suffrage movement really sort of started in England in a way, and it was much more radical than the American movement. Um, and it was Alice Paul and Lucy Burns who were in England studying, you know, for, you know, at the university, who ended up getting involved in the suffrage movement, ended up in jail. When they came back to America, they were like, you know what? 
we've been waiting too long. We've got to radicalize this movement. And they were the ones who radicalized it and got it over the top, like I told you earlier in the interview. But basically, here's Mrs. Burns, you know, with a, a woman, votes for women's sash over her, going up and down the steps singing, you know, shoulder to shoulder, you know, suffragettes. And she starts talking about, you know, what's going on in England and the right to vote. And I'm sitting there thinking, I've watched this movie, I would say, 25 times, and I never knew Mrs. Burns was a suffragette until I started studying this. So basically, we were never taught it. We never had books to read. There were never any movies about it. We knew nothing about our own history. So later in my life, you know, I don't even want to say what age I was, you know, and give it away. But later in my life, when I've already served as a town supervisor for years, I've already been a vice president of a major advertising agency. I've already been trying to, like, you know, break down, like, the glass ceiling to an extent. I'm first finding out about the history of the right to vote. And that was why this book was written. Susan Zimmett, thank you for joining us here on Book Spectrum. <laughs> thank you, Chris, very much for having me. Once again, the book is Roses and Radicals, the epic story of how American women won the right to vote from Susan Zimmett. You can find out more about Susan on her website, susanzimmett.com, as well as how to get the book. And you can find out more about how to get the book also on our website, bookspectrum.com. <laughs> 